Sonne über dem Marsch der roten Kolonne. Sang der Gesänge, ich bin so Sonne über dem Marsch der roten Kolonne. Land sei bereit. Vorwärts. Hello, welcome back to What's Left Up North, the Communist Party Czech Bay's video channel. I'm Elise Cayley, I'm running for Ashland City Council, and behind the camera is my party comrade Andrew McKinnis, president of the Ashland Socialist Rifle Association. This is episode three of Homeland Are You Mine Again, our study of the music of Holocaust survivors Ernst Busch and Lynn Yaldati. Today, we're going to talk about Spain. Spain is a country in the Iberian Peninsula. Is that all we've got? Huh? Guess today's gonna be really short. See you. Some brief context for where the anti-fascist struggle was in Spain in the 30s is that the dictatorship of Primo de Rivera had fallen in the early 1930s and a liberal republic was proclaimed. It was very unstable, of course, not only because of uh, Carlists who wanted to bring back the pre-Primo monarchy, but also because the Catholic Church and the Spanish armed forces feared that increasing electoral democracy might lead to women's rights and even worse, workers' rights. And of course, the aristocracy who owned the Latifundia, the enormous estates, basically feudal agriculture that was still the mainstay of the Spanish economy, they were pissed too because they could no longer hunt peasant. In February 1936, you had various anti-fascist and anti-monarchist groups come together in the Popular Front, a strategy that we talked about back in Chapter 1. This had elements of moderate Republican factions, various liberal groups. Uh, primarily, of course, it was a socialist and communist undertaking who were banding together and realized just what a threat there was in Spain and elsewhere now. We would see leaders, visionary leaders, like Dolores Ibarruri, Juan Negrin, and Largo Caballero come together, th those were representatives of the communist and socialist parties respectively, come together and bring about what was really a revolutionary outcome of an election. They proceeded to generally be badasses, like guaranteeing education to all children, and no longer letting the church decide who would be allowed to be educated, who would be allowed to read. They recognized farmers' occupations of the landlord's estates. The government didn't initiate collectivization. The workers just did that, and the government said, you do you, because this is not a feudal economy anymore. This is supposed to be for all people. A lot was happening very quickly in just the first few months the Popular Front government took office. Roll the Riego hymn. <laughs> Wir sind mit Stolz und Ehrfurcht die tapferen Kameraden, die auf den Barrikaden gefallen für Madrid. Die Menschheit wird staunen beim Klang unserer Lieder und sehen in uns wieder die wahren Söhne des Hit. Sei Vorbild, er wusste zu wagen, in Urenkeltagen wird leuchten noch sein Mut. Er wagte zu kämpfen, besiegte die Knechte, der päpfischen Mächte vertrieb die Bourbonenbrut. Soldaten, das Land verlangt, ruft uns auf zu Streit, wir siegen oder sterben, getreu dem Heiligen Heilt. Herbei zu den Waffen, nur sie können noch richten, nur sie können vernichten, Verbrechen, Gewalt und Betrug. Und so hat wohl immer ein Volk kämpfen müssen, dem die Geduld gerissen, der Tag der Freiheit schlug. Soldaten, das harte Land, ruft uns auf zum Streit, wir siegen oder sterben, getreu dem Heiligen Heil. 
changes had a, a lot of consequences. For the first time, women were allowed to learn to read because the church wasn't running education anymore. Unions could organize without being shot on sight, and the church no longer controlled education or social policy. Things like wife beating began to be taken very seriously. There actually were laws put in place to protect people rather than to oppress them. And of course, the church and military were not happy about any of these things. They launched a coup in July of 1936. In addition to Spain's own bourgeoisie and former monarchists, they had active support from Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and a prominent group of American elites led by the Bush family, specifically Senator Prescott Bush, who was father of uh, George H.W. and grandfather of George W. Bush. The military led uprisings all over Spain and started slaughtering anyone they could get their hands on who'd been involved in any way with the women's movement, the union movement, the peasants movement, it was just brutal. But people who had sworn an oath to defend the country and as usually interpreted its own people were just killing them almost for sport. People of course responded to this. Just a few months of seeing what was possible really inspired people to come together in a way that I don't think many people expected. Within days, there were militias made up of factory girls who had been legally forbidden to even attend primary school until three months before, and they were taking up arms against their own country's military. Let's just let that sink in a moment. Teenagers, in the process of being freed from Dickensian conditions, fighting just for the right to learn to read fighting their own country soldiers for their freedom, fighting and dying against the people who had sworn to protect them but were now trying to enslave them again. That's Spain 1936. Of course, they weren't fighting alone. Many soldiers, and especially sailors, remained loyal to the elected government, and even the police mostly stayed loyal, which, again, surprised everyone. But the Republic had another interesting source of military manpower. At this time, Spain had been preparing to host a People's Olympics to protest that the Olympics were happening in Nazi Germany that year. The coup prevented this from happening, but what that meant was that there were a large number of extremely athletic, extremely angry, and extremely desperate German exiles in Spain at exactly the moment that the Republic needed to create a new army. These would-be athletes would become the first of the 6,000 Germans who would come to try to defend a free Spain against their country's wickedness. They would fight in what would be called the Tailman Battalion in honor of the imprisoned communist leader we discussed in chapter one. In total, some 40,000 people from over a dozen countries would come volunteer for the Republic. A plurality of them would come from France. These included, of course, many Germans we've discussed before. Uh, Hans Beimler, a German communist leader who was imprisoned in Dachau, beaten and starved for three weeks. Then, when he was being interrogated again, proceeded to kill an SS trooper with his bare hands, steal his uniform, and walk out of the camp in broad daylight. There would be people coming from all over the world, like we said. Uh, James Holt Peck would become the first African-American American fighter ace in the skies over Madrid, the African-American nurse Solaria Key, the French philosopher Simone Weil, the Soviet journalist Ilya Ehrenberg, American writers, artists, and workers of every stripe, a telephone and telegraph technician by the name of Delmar Berg, a Dr. Donawa, a Haitian-American dentist. People came from all over to try to defend and contribute as they could, and Ernst Busch was one of them. So this is where the story picks up. When the war began, Ernst was in the Soviet Union. The Soviets and the Communist International absolutely rallied to the cause of Spain, disseminating propaganda, creating and distributing art, recruiting volunteers, and sending military equipment to try to safeguard the Spanish Republic. They were alone in this case. Britain, France, the United States all insisted on stopping any aid from reaching the Republic and allowing, even in many cases supporting, the German and Italian navies in blockading Spain, so it was only the Soviet Union and Mexico that recognized the legitimate elected government of Spain. This really had an impression on a lot of people, most notably Lin Yaldati, who at this point was, as we've mentioned before, she was a Yiddish singer and historian of Yiddish folk music living in the Netherlands. Seeing that 
the Soviets were the ones who were standing up to the Nazis when they tried to install a friendly government in Spain was probably the formative experience of her political awakening. She began using her voice for the anti-fascist movement uh, as an accomplished singer and respected figure in the Netherlands Jewish community. She was an amazing asset to tell people that resistance was possible. At this point, the Nazis had barred Jewish people from academia, medicine, the military, and even citizenship, had dissolved marriages, started incarcerating people en masse, certainly fomented and turned a blind eye to large-scale mob violence, to say nothing of all the things that the stormtroopers did themselves. Things were early, but it was very clear which direction the wind was blowing. It's worth noting, of course, that this was still the early stages, a large part of of the right-wing violence in Germany and in Spain was aimed at labor movement leaders or even participants, queer people, communists. I think we have to, I wish we didn't have to, but I think we have to extend special respect to people who saw genocide's beginning and said that's wrong. No matter what my religion says, that's wrong. Like, to this day, many religious people of all stripes will at least reluctantly condemn the Nazi slaughter of European Jews, but will condone or even applaud the genocide of Germany's gay community. The fact that that wasn't an excuse that stopped Yaldati from saying, this is wrong. This is where we're going to make our stand. We are fighting with the communists because they're the ones who are defying the Nazis. And I think it's also significant that she would later live in a country that really did try to support and protect everyone who had joined in that anti-fascist struggle. We're about to hear both Bush and Yaldati perform The Secret Mobilization, and this song is a pretty clear-cut example of the socialist view of fascism that we've discussed before. This song debuted in the late 30s, although each of these recordings are post-war, hence Lynn's denunciation of the Marshall Plan, which obviously was not a thing in 1936. We'll hear them sing about the role racism plays to mobilize people against the Soviet Union and other anti-imperialist powers, while also arguing that all war makes profits for the reactionaries. Every war is a war against all working people, regardless of country. Roll secret mobilization, both of them. Es geht durch die Welt ein Geflüster. Arbeiter, hörst du es nicht? Das sind die Stimmen der Kriegsminister. Arbeiter, hörst du sie nicht? Es flüstern die Kohle- und Stahlproduzenten, es flüstern die chemische Kriegsindustrie, es flüstern von all ihren Kontinenten. Krieg den Volksdemokratien, Arbeiter, Bauern, schlag den Faschisten, Dolch und Gewehr aus der Hand. Erdreist die Atomen, die Militaristen, eh alle Länder im Land. Pflanzt eure roten Banner der Arbeit auf jeden Acker, auf jede Fabrik. Dann steigt aus den Trümmern der alten Gesellschaft die sozialistische Volksrepublik. Sie trommeln schon wieder Hurra ins Feld für Freiheit, Nation und Rasse. So hetzen sie euch für den Geldsack der Welt gegen die Arbeiterklasse. Der Überfall auf die Sowjetunion steht im Marschplan zur Rettung der Reaktion. Und der Krieg, der jetzt durch die Länder geht, ist der Krieg gegen dich, Prolet. Arbeiter, Bauern, schlag den Faschisten, Dolch und Gewehr aus der Hand. Entreiß die Atome den Militaristen, eh alle Länder im Brand. Pflanzt eure roten Banner der Arbeit auf jeden Acker, auf jede Fabrik. Dann steigt aus den Trümmern der alten Gesellschaft die sozialistische Volksrepublik. Dann steigt aus den Trümmern der alten Gesellschaft der Menschheit Frieden, der Menschheit Glück. Es geht durch die Welt ein Geflüster. Arbeiter, hörst du es nicht? Das sind die Stimmen der Kriegsminister. 
Arbeiter, hörst du sie nicht? Es flüstern die Kohle- und Stahlproduzenten. Es flüstert die chemische Kriegsproduktion. Es flüstert von allen Kontinenten. Mobilmachung gegen die Sowjetunion. Sie ziehen ins Feld und schreien für Nation und Rasse. Das ist der Krieg der Herrscher der Welt gegen die Arbeiterklasse. Denn der Angriff gegen die Sowjetunion ist der Stoß ins Herz der Revolution. Und der Krieg, der jetzt durch die Länder geht, ist der Krieg gegen dich, Prolet. And that really wasn't a fringe view. And we can see that it had appeal in the West, as in the Soviet Union, which is, is really cool that you had both Western and Eastern artists coming forward to talk about this. Letting the Nazis build up, rearm, wouldn't just mean destruction for their immediate targets. It could mean the death of hope for working people everywhere. The fact that a young Jewish folk singer could look at the rise of the Nazis just over the border and see that the socialist movement was the only force willing to stand up to them is pretty key for explaining the 1930s. There were already the Nuremberg Laws, there was already the escalation of eugenics programs to kill the disabled, and now Nazi Germany was spreading its wings to support a similarly genocidal regime in Spain as a prelude to a general war. This was really, really serious. To a socialist view, defending a democratic Spain was also defending a socialist Soviet Union. And this is what Ernst Busch came to do, to entertain the troops on the front lines while they fought for freedom. At one point in 1937, which was clearly his finest moment, for a fundraising stunt, he recruited a choir from the Tailman Battalion, and they waited for the city of Barcelona to come under bombardment and they recorded an album during the raid. It was called Six Songs for Democracy, and while German bombs were falling on the city, these Germans recorded songs, including the peat bog soldiers, which had come out of the concentration camps. This is what East Germany was going for when they tried to claim that there had been a better Germany. First off, let, let's listen to the song of the Tailman Battalion. Wann im Himmel breitet seine Sterne über unsere Schützengräben aus und der Morgen grüßen aus der Ferne, bald geht es zum neuen Kampf hinaus. Die Heimat ist weit, doch wir sind bereit. Wir kämpfen und liegen für dich. Freiheit! Dem Faschisten werden wir nicht weichen. Schickt er auf die Kugeln Hagel dich. Mit uns stehen Kameraden ohne Gleichen. Und ein Rückwärts gibt es für uns nicht. Hey, 
Marionette, Arad Mark, der Sieg ist unser Lohn. Mit der Freiheit eine Prächtigkette, auf zum Kampf, das Themenbataillon. Now, I'd like to talk a little about the next one and how it fits into this question of national identity. Like, wh what is there to be proud of when your country commits a genocide, when your country invades other countries, when your country declares you're no longer a part of it? And I think we can all say that as leftists, we all might tend to be a little overly honest about our country's deeds. And many of us, myself included, are pretty disturbed by overt national pride. It kind of smacks of all the militarism and empire that's come along with that. And then along come the fascists saying how great our country is or was and that people should be proud of it. Well, that, that, that gets infectious. Socialist movements, partially because of this, have often tried to create national pride in anti-imperialist actions and traditions, and that's still a work in progress. And this is a particularly interesting point on that progress because a national identity here is being claimed by fighting against your own countrymen when they do fashy things. The legacy of the Tailman Battalion would be claimed as the foundation of a new Germany to love one's country enough to try to stop it from doing wrong. And some of these lyrics really evoke that pretty effectively, I think. The, we haven't really lost our homeland. Our homeland is atop Madrid's ramparts. Also, uh, we in the United States can laugh at the prescience of progressives rejoicing at stopping a fascist military parade in the capital. Four words, international brigades. Wir entfernen Vaterland geboren, nahmen nichts als harten Herzen mit. Doch wir haben die Heimat nicht verloren, unsere Heimat ist heute vor Madrid. Doch wir haben die Heimat nicht verloren, unsere Heimat ist heute vor Madrid. Spaniens Brüder stehen auf der Barrikade, unsere Brüder sind Bauer und Prolet. Torres Internationale Brigade, auf die Fahne der Solidarität. Torres Internationale Brigade, auf die Fahne der Solidarität. Spaniens Freiheit heißt jetzt unsere Ehre, unser Herz ist international. Ja, zum Teufel die fremden Legionäre. Jagd ins Meer den Banditen General. Jagd zum Teufel die fremden Legionäre. Jagd ins Meer den Banditen General. Freunde schon in Madrid sich zur Parade. Doch wir waren schon da, er ja kam zu spät. Torres Internationale Brigade, hoch die Fahne der Solidarität. Torres Internationale Brigade, hoch die Fahne der Solidarität. Mit Gewehren, Bomben und Granaten wird das Ungeziefer ausgebrannt. Frei das Land von Banditen und Piraten, Brüder Spaniens, denn euch gehört das Land. Frei das Land von Banditen und Piraten, Brüder Spaniens, denn euch gehört das Land. Den Faschisten gesindelt keine Gnade, keine Gnade dem Hunter und Verrät. Torwärts internationale Brigade, hoch die Fahne der Solidarität. Torwärts internationale Brigade, hoch die Fahne der Solidarität. 
this next song is important because it's one of relatively few that Bush himself wrote the lyrics for, and it was composed by Soviet publicist Grisha Schneerson. Schneerson decided to manage Bush's tour in Spain once they'd met in the Soviet Union, and he was always at Bush's side wherever they went. Ernst would later stay with Grisha whenever he visited Moscow for medical treatment in the future or when he went there for special recordings and he would ask for him on his deathbed. So um, yeah, Bush was as bi as Napoleon's hat and their relationship is amazing and I'm enjoying the more I can learn about it because I, I totally ship them. On to the song itself. In addition to the full version containing some pointed shots at the church for smuggling guns on on behalf of the Nazis to the Spanish fascists. I think it's a really cool thing that this song was written and composed on the front lines by two men who had never, never written or composed songs before and were probably doinking while they did it, which makes it a really, really romantic story. In Spanien stand zum unsere Sache schlecht zurück. Ging Schritt um Schritt und die Faschisten brüllten schon. Gefallen ist die Stadt Madrid. Da kamen sie aus aller Welt mit einem roten Stern am Hut. Im Manzanares kühlten sie dem Franco das zu heiße Blut. Das waren Tage der Brigade 11 und ihrer Freiheit Fahne. Brigada Internacional ist unser Ehrenname. Brigada Internacional ist unser Ehrenname. Bei Guadalajara im Monat März in Kälte und Regensturm, da bete man tapfre Herz und in Torita selbst der Turm. Da stand der Garibaldi auf, André Dombrowski ihm zur Seite. Die brachten bald zum Dauerlauf. Die Mussolini Herrlichkeit. Das waren Tage der Brigade elf und ihrer Freiheit zwar. Brigada international ist unser Ehrenname. Brigada international ist unser Kinto gab es nichts als Staub, vom Himmel fiel nur Schmutz. Und Kinto selbst war ausgebaut, nach deutschem Plan und Musterschutz. Der Ton, der da vom Kirchturm pfiff, kam nicht vom heiligen Gral. Wir fanden in dem Kirchenschiff von Krupp ein ganzes Arsenal. Das waren Tage der Brigade elf und ihrer Freiheit Fahne. Brigada international ist unser Ehrenname. Brigada international ist Dauert's auch noch sieben Jahr, dass wir im Kampf stehen. Ein jeder Krieg wird einmal gar, wir werden Deutschland wiedersehen. Dann ziehen wir zum deutschen Tor mit Passaremos ein. 
Was übrig bleibt vom Hakenkreuz, versenken wir im Vater rein. Das werden Tag der Brigade 11 und ihrer Freiheit fahren. Brigada International bleibt stets ein Ehrenname. After the Republic fell, Ernst Busch was captured by the Belgian authorities, uh, held until the Nazis invaded, and then turned over to the Vichy government, where he spent four years in a concentration camp in brutal conditions. Lynn Yaldati continued her activism and went underground to continue performing in secret when the Nazis overran the Netherlands. We'll check in on what happened next in our next video. Um, pick things up there. Thanks for watching. This really means a lot that you're helping us keep Bush's story alive and helping us learn more about Lin Yaldati too. We'd appreciate a like, a share, a subscription, or best of all, support on Patreon. We'll be back next time, as we said, with what happened to Ernst Bush and Lin Yaldati once the actual Nazis got their hands on them, how they each survived, and what they did and didn't say about their experiences in their music after the war. I hope you all can stay safe the next few weeks, and the several weeks after that, and after that, of course. Hold front. Hold front.